my, our dream, our dream is to somehow reproduce in a laboratory the conditions that led to life and then the chemical steps that led to life from molecules to large structures of molecules to perhaps some set of molecules that reproduce themselves and then to natural selection and Darwinian evolution in a test tube in the laboratory. Perhaps someday having such a system encapsulated by a membrane. We can imagine these things. We can think about them happening. But when that happens, oh, it may be decades, it may be a hundred years. Some scientists think that life could be synthesized once you know the right recipe in days, perhaps even hours, that it just goes like that and it happens. Other people think perhaps these chemical steps take years or decades to take place, in which case to do this in a laboratory would be very difficult and take a great deal of patience. If it takes more than a human lifetime, we may never see the complete transition from non-life to life. I'm hoping it takes much shorter, maybe a week, maybe a month. <laughs> but this will be years before it's possible. In fact, life is a unique event that we have not managed to reproduce experimentally. We lack data. We cannot observe the moment and the conditions in which it emerged, even though we ourselves, our species, is one of the final proofs of this event, and we share its basic functions with our first bacterial ancestors. The first cells already had a range of behavior. They knew how to reproduce themselves, to divide and multiply themselves, and how to obtain substances from the outside world and transform them into the energy needed to live. But they were not conscious of anything, not like we are. Millions of years of evolution were needed to transform matter into consciousness. Why does a certain pattern of activity in our brain translate into our having a notion of ourselves? Why do we have subjective experiences? These are complicated questions to answer. For some scientists, the problem of consciousness will be solved by analyzing and describing the mental processes responsible for it. With what we know of molecular biology, with what we know of chemistry, with what we know of physics nowadays, we still don't know how to focus, how to put into a scientific context the origin of consciousness. With the science that we know nowadays, a laboratory science of experiments and laboratories, we are not able to explain consciousness as we observe it. A phenomenon is described as emerging, when the whole is more than the simple sum of its parts. I believe that consciousness is an emerging phenomenon and it is a consequence of the existence of the enormous number of connections among the neurons that a human being has in his brain. But I can't explain it. No one has ever seen consciousness emerge in experimental conditions. Nor has anyone formulated a theory with respect to how to achieve that. This does not mean that science has not managed to demythify the problem. In the last few years, with the arrival on the scene of powerful imaging techniques such as nuclear magnetic resonance or positron tomography, we have been able to see the brain in action. But the workings of the organ of comprehension is more complex than the sum of its parts. The study of brains with lesions that produce anomalous behavior has shed a lot of light on how the brain functions. It is a way of observing the organ of comprehension that sometimes requires strange starting points to identify processes that are certainly enigmatic. Well, two techniques commonly used are um, correlating the location of the lesion with changes in behavior. You know, when a small part of the brain is damaged, you, you get not an across-the-board reduction in all your abilities, but often a highly selective loss. And that gives you confidence in asserting that that part of the brain is involved in that function. Another technique is to do functional brain imaging, where different parts of the brain light up when you engage in different tasks, and you can actually image these parts of the brain. And by combining these two techniques, we can now learn a great deal about localization of brain function. And I think a better word is specialization rather than localization, that some part of the brain is specialized for mediating a particular function. 
There are many striking examples. One is the fusiform gyrus in the temporal lobes, which we know has cells specialized for processing color. There's an area called V4, which seems to be primarily involved in color processing. There's another area which is mainly involved in perceiving and recognizing people's faces. And we know that the signals from there, from the fusiform, then get relayed onto the amygdala and the limbic system to produce the appropriate emotional reactions to the visual images that you're looking at. Being aware that we are walking down the street or that we are eating is natural and spontaneous for us. But this consciousness is the result of a very complex system. The images, smells, and flavors interact within our heads with abstract thoughts that place us in the world. We process a large quantity of experiences and stimuli, such that everything we experience affects us. And in spite of that, our minds seem to enjoy a certain balance. How is that possible? How do we manage to survive among the complexity of the chaos that surrounds us? It's because our brain is the fruit of nature. The answer may seem wanting, but thanks to the fact that our brains behave like other complex systems in nature, we can maintain a balance. The key is interaction. We live in chaos. The cosmos is plagued with systems ruled by an order that we are not able to systematize. Like meteorology, we can predict what the weather will be like a week from now, but not if it will rain 365 days from now. The atmosphere is an example of an internally organized and interconnected system. All the particles that form it follow cycles that we cannot describe completely since the set of interactions is very high. That is why the weather is so changeable, but also so stable. In the end, although we don't know when, it will rain. It was precisely a meteorologist, Edward Lawrence, who realized that when the calculations of the equations used to try to predict the climate conditions were rounded off, the results were radically different. He had found the butterfly effect. Everything is influenced by everything. The butterfly effect asserts that the simple movement of a butterfly's wings in one part of the planet can determine the appearance of a hurricane in another part of the globe. Its minuscule effort feeds off other forces and is able to create a cascade of events that unleashes a great organized force. Thus the random becomes something necessary. Chaos generates order. You can have a collection of different uh, objects which behave chaotically, but the overall effect is ordered. So if, for example, you uh, drop grains of sand down onto a table to create a pile of sand. Each of the trajectories of the sand grains is chaotic. If you change it a little bit, it'll fall in a completely different way onto the sand pile. But gradually, as the sand pile builds up, it produces a pile that has a very particular slope. It doesn't just keep getting steeper and steeper. Eventually, it stops getting steeper, and avalanches of sand occur and keep that same slope. So we have there a collection of chaotically unpredictable events that produces large-scale order. And many features of our world are consequences of this peculiar process where chaotic events come together to produce order. It's what happens in an economy, it's what happens in the traffic flow on the motorway, uh, or in a biological system where there's a complicated interplay between extinction, uh, catastrophe, new species developing. So this is how complicated systems become robust and stable. Many chaotic processes come together to produce an overall order. Chaos operates on every scale. On the Earth, millions of tiny forms work, each one with its independent evolution, 
forming a complete interdependence, as also happens in a cell, with its membrane, mitochondria, and centrioles. A cell is a microcosmos of what life has achieved on our planet. This is precisely one of the characteristics of chaos. We find reflections of the cosmos within each of its parts. These self-contained forms are what we call fractal forms. They seem reflections of other larger or smaller forms. We can even generate fractal forms in an artificial way by partially imitating nature. This image looks a lot like a fern, but it is simply a graphic image made with points scattered chaotically following a non-lineal formula. The discovery of the new fractal geometry has allowed us to peek into a world that is artificial, but strangely organic, unpredictable, and fascinating. One of its founders was Benoit B. Mandelbrot, who in 1980 surprised scientists with the first detailed graphic of the evolution of a dynamic system.